Hello, 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 hello. I am making a video with my baby dog together. And it looks nice in here with my artwork, with the spot lamp on. So, very nice. And also over there, that spot lamp is shining onto my artwork. And over there, onto that artwork. Looks pretty good. So, yeah, it makes a really, really warm light so the light is always nice and then with the walls being slightly peach so that gives a very very warm a warm illumination yeah the house is getting ready now gradually so I was outside getting grounded on my self-made lounge chair it is so nice that I made out of the fallen Douglas fir tree and with the, the cut wire wine that Paul cut during the summertime and that was like this big huge volume of wire wine not and that was so big that was as big as I am and I laid that on top of the Douglas fir because before I couldn't really sit on the Douglas fir because the Douglas fir bark is very is very coarse and it has a very it has kind of sharp edges within within the structure of the bark so it cuts into your butt when you sit on it but after I put the wire wine bundle on it it was very very nice like putting a cushion on any launch chair and so then I was able to sit on that and I was able to squish it down a little bit and then I was able to lie down on it and look into the sky and that is so nice and I did this for like I don't know half an hour I was out there and I was watching the evening sun and the sky was pink and light blue striped it's the truth and that was the most beautiful pink the most beautiful pink and light blue striped sky in the whole world that I saw and I was just in awe was that for a long time and then the bats came and they were catching insects in the air all over the place and that was nice to see the bats so this ecosystem here is still quite healthy we even have these things these it's some kind of mushroom it's in the mushroom family it's <laughs> called lichen and when you see lichen formation on trees or in limbs or anywhere on cement walls also they grow up on it they they look they they're kind of like scaly and they have the most amazing ghost green in the world and that's i think it's somewhere in the in the the fungi family and it i think it's healthy to eat it i don't know i'm not, I'm not gonna test it out but i would have to research that first but when you see that formation of called lichen anywhere in any environment then that's an indication that the environment is healthy so a botanist lady did a botany hike with us one time 
out there in the wetlands, the bird sanctuary. And that was very interesting. She talked about this. And she said, so this is a very healthy environment. And I hope it stays healthy. So Paul and I have helped the local environmental stewardship group many years ago to protect the bird sanctuary and and we brought the, together with all the other people that helped we brought the egret population back to a healthy number so then later on when whenever we went out there hiking with our our former dogs with Kenny with the papa dog we haven't taken the baby dog there yet so whenever we went back there then we saw a whole bunch of egrets those are white northern northern pacific cranes and they live in those wetlands and they you know they they wade through the water the shallow water sometimes it, there's high water table and then they pick out out of the the water they pick out different insects and fish and and aquatic animals and so they live on that and then they they all sit in the trees because they feel safe there and then one time this entire tree like i think it was a it's a willow tree and the entire willow tree was full of egrets and that was wonderful for us to see really really nice that's great so it's great to do environmental work you know so when you can actually see the results so it's really good you know it's, it's good it's a good thing yeah, and I talk about this because I want other people to do that too. Okay, so it will always be misunderstood by some people when I talk about this. You must be grandstanding. You must be patting yourself on the shoulder. Yes, oh, you bet I am. You know, because we've done a lot of environmental work and animal rights work, and it's good. It's good. Okay, so Friedrich Nietzsche talks about this. It's very interesting what he says in his book Beyond Good and Evil. What he observes, you know, he, he ob observed Germany and particularly the ar aristocratic circles in Germany because that's where he was hanging out that's the kind of people that he encountered a lot because there were publishers of course they were interested in his work and so he was very lucky that he could live on that on just writing he was also a professor for a while but then towards the end he quit doing that he didn't like doing this anymore he didn't like to be around a lot of people I guess then he retreated more into nature and he went to Switzerland into some kind of bed and breakfast hotel and he had a permanent room there and he was lucky he was able to afford that and just focus on writing alone and what he observed was that in this and he called it atavism atavism is is something is really i don't know if he really understood the word correctly but atavism in biology means that a specific characteristic or f phenotype in in evolution like some some kind of phenomenological feature in an animal that had been seen in a while suddenly reoccurs so that's called atavism and 
but he he refers he uses he hijacks that word and uses it for as a psychological wor word as a sociological wor word in in terms of what he is studying you know he's privately observing and studying the public and so he says that there are certain characteristics that maybe he understood it correctly certain characteristics in people certain certain mental characteristics that that keep on going and that keep on reoccurring also and it happens when a specific demographic becomes complacent for example uses use atavism in terms of any kind of characteristic that reoccurs so but he was talking specifically now about the public and what he observes when people are, when people, or an entire demographic that has sort of gone through generations and now has become more stable psychologically or feels safer, and then there is another evolutionary development happening when when they reach a certain level of complacency or or safety then it turns over into arrogance and it turns over into like where people start to compare each other and when they have enough time on their hands, when, when they don't have to be worried or have to do just the bare basics in order to survive, then they become complacent and they then they start they start comparing themselves to others and then they start to do weird 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 games, gaming, weird hunting practices, all of this like trophy hunting, comparisons, different groups and organizations that then develop what he called monstrosities and it is very applicable for his time as well as for this time. What he is saying is very up to date. Okay, he wrote this this in the mid late eighteen hundreds. Still very up to date. Okay, when you read his books, they do not become obsolete. They do not become a relic of the past. Okay, they are they are very relevant to modern times and I wouldn't be surprised if they stay relevant in the future as well. So because obviously not much has changed in the human species, people wanna they wanna think of themselves as a lot of people think in group terms, like we have evolved. <laughs> or one doesn't do that anymore. I know I've heard these things from my own family. One doesn't do that anymore. Hmm, I wonder why one. And in Germany, that's even better. Man macht es nicht mehr. Man. Huh. In, in English, one that is, isn't gender specific. In Germany, the same word for one, one doesn't do this, man doesn't do this, is man doesn't do this. They still have that going in, the la in that language. It's still actively going <laughs> to this day. This type of sexism, you know, a lot of feminists have gotten mad about this, but then other feminists have said, man, let it go. <laughs> Let them use that. The entire language is 
porous. The entire German language is ready to collapse. Okay. And it's going to, okay, it's slowly phasing out, you know, I see more and more people starting to bind the English language into it, particularly those people that live in English-speaking countries that come from Germany, when they speak to Germans, they go back and forth, and that's happening to me now too, because there are certain words, certain the certain terminology that I have learned in the English language, in the English speaking realm, and not in the German speaking realm. So I wouldn't even know how to translate this back into German. So I don't even bother, I will just weave it in because I want the Germans to start picking up on the English language. And there are still Germans that don't speak English very well. You know, that most do, most speak English quite well, actually, but better than we did in the past, before we went to English-speaking countries, because of the internet, of course, but still, there are still people in Germany that don't speak English very well. So now they really have to do some catching up because, because we will only have one language and that's, that's the US version English. We're gonna have that worldwide. I see now the US version English is taking over, not just taking over other non-English speaking countries, but even English speaking countries are now adapting the, the, the US version English and the, the, the particular wording, the particular expressions, the accents, also, it's very interesting to see that. So even in countries where they used to have their own distinct accents, are the new generations are now switching over to the U.S. version, and that's simply because of internet, because they hang out on the internet, and the internet is dominated by the U.S. version English. It's very interesting because, you know, the the United Kingdom is quite large and and Canada is Canada is almost the same as the US version of course with very very minute differences and Australia too the new generations are adapting to the US version English very interesting even though Australia is huge but maybe not as hugely populated as the United States is. So, and then show business is also mainly coming from the United States. And of course, Silicon Valley, of course, uh, the entire computer industry is happening here. So they have quite a bit of an influence. They make video games and all of that has an influence on the young young generations worldwide. So but according to what Friedrich Nietzsche was observing, when people become complacent they they, they start to develop monstrosities. That doesn't apply to all people of course, but it applies to the average human. So it doesn't apply to a very advanced soul, obviously. And the, the advanced souls are obviously in a, in a minute min minority worldwide. So they're, they're spread out, their diaspora, or whatever you want to call it, you know, is their atomization around the, the globe is far in between each of these souls, you know. So they are like they're they're not one conglomeration. 
Okay, a lot of times I hear people, them animal rights activists, this group of people, and they are not a group of people. They are not a conglomeration. They are not a congregation. I wish they were. We could do more work, get get more done if we also group together and help each other. No, it's also what Friedrich Nietzsche observed. The angels and the gods are far apart from each other. They seem to not group together. They seem to not draw to each other like a magnet. They draw to the polar opposites. Okay. Paul's mother is a perfect example. It's a good Samaritan, kind-hearted person, advanced soul and attracted, she attracted mean people, she attracted those people that that were not nice, that took advantage of her, you know, that used her, that are user type of people, and she loved all of them. Okay. So, she would probably not like me that much because I'm I'm like her. I'm just so it's like two poles of the same type. Two positives, right? That will repel each other actually. It's the negative and the positive that attracts one another, the the polar opposites. So the polarity, uh, so minus and plus, they want to equalize, they want to merge into the, the equalization. So this is the law of physics. This seems to also be the law of psychology. And Friedrich Nietzsche observed that very, very sharply in people because he kind of complained about that that it is like that because he was lonely and he wanted to be around like-minded people but couldn't find them so he called out a shout out to Dostoyevsky praising his books I've never read just Dostoyevsky so Fyodor Dostoyevsky so I believe he was a Russian writer and uh, Friedrich Nietzsche was very, very much in favor of him and his writings, and and he saw that was a great soul. But as he said, these great souls they they can only talk to each other through their books, through eons and eons of time spans in between and masses and masses of people in between. And they don't even get the chance to find each other and talk to each other and pat each other on the shoulder and say, well done, you know, I feel you, I hear you, I, I know what you're going through, you know, but that can only, only be done through their books, you know, so the books that say, yeah, the book says, I feel you, I hear you, you know, but the person is not in the physical anymore of those books, or they are worlds apart. One lives at the Orion Nebula, the other one lives at the Horsehead Nebula. One lives on Earth, one lives on Mars, or on Planet Love, or in Pompeii, and the other one lives in Kazakhstan, uh, so, so, or at the North Pole, or whatever, you know, or they don't just don't get the chance to meet each other, you know, Helena Petrovna Blavatsky, she and Friedrich Nietzsche never crossed paths, so, and they were contemporaries. 
So she traveled around the whole planet. Then she settled in England. She died in England. Also way too early at age 60, I believe. So, yeah, I think she was born in... Nineteen in eighteen thirty one, yeah, eighteen thirty one, and died in eighteen ninety one. So they were contemporaries. Friedrich Nietzsche died in nineteen hundred at age sixty six. So Helena was just a few years older than him not even a generation older than him. They could have crossed paths if they had. They would have had so much in common. It would have been amazing. But they never found each other. She was into the esoteric. She was into the occult. Friedrich Nietzsche was very, very opposed to all of that. During his time, in the particularly during his first 40 years of life, or maybe 50 years of life, he put all of that into the, the same folder with the label religion. So that's what Paul does now. So that's a mistake, obviously, because the occult is not religion. There are religions that are trying to use the occult, but occult itself ha has no religion attached to it or name. It just is that is the physics of energy, the physics of the ether and also of psychology, the, the physics of thoughts and intentions and meanings, all kinds of meanings, star signs, numerology, all of that falls into this. Although I am I'm not that much interested in numerology and star signs but I hear things here and there and it's interesting I will listen to it but not I'm not particularly interested in it what interests me mainly is to bring love into the world that is my main mission that I am working on okay I want love to come into the world because love is also part of the ether, part of the occult. You cannot fake love. Okay. That's the beauty of it. So love can happen to someone, to, cr to a criminal too. It can happen in their brains even. It usually doesn't happen very often in their brains, but it can when they have a moment of silence. It can happen. But only then. Only in a fleeting moment of being able to put themselves into someone else's shoes. Energetically, psychologically, of course. So not like Aschenputtel the, the queen put, put pressing her foot into Aschenputtel's shoe. Right? So the modern version of Aschenputtel, so Cinderella, would be where actually Cinderella has the bigger feet <laughs> than the others. <laughs> it's reversed now. So Cinderella would have, to, the modern Cinderella has a oh, real hard time putting her feet into some little corrupt woman's surely <laughs> and also mentally of course 
Yeah, Cinderella would never fit into any kind of template or psychological shoe. And that's why it's hard for her to understand other people. And I'm talking about I'm talking about the Cinderella of today. I'm talking about the modern animal rights activist, environmentalist, the modern artist. And that brings me to what I wanted to talk about in this video while I was lying out there looking into the pink and light blue striped November sky. I was thinking, as I always do, about you, Philip Jones. Yes, you heard it correctly. And whoever you are, Danny, Zane, W.C. Davis, whatever your different pseudonyms are, or whether there are different people, it does not matter at all. Okay. So if you meet me on eye level, if you come to me and you say something nice, like the other day, someone said something nice to me in the chat room. And I was so startled by that. But because in that moment when that guy said to me, Nikki, you're dope. I was like, ah, that can't be true, right? That someone can't be saying something nice to me, right? That's no, that can't be, that can't, that cannot be happening. So I thought that must be, I must have misunderstood it or something. My Asperger's also, it's hard for me to understand other people, to read other people, read their intentions, really read how they feel, put myself into their shoes, right? I, But I didn't forget about it, okay, so I don't forget these things. I don't forget it when someone says something nice. It registers in, my, in the back of my brain, in my heart, in my solar plexus. And I want to say thank you to you for that. But you're too afraid to say it as yourself. You're too afraid to come over and say to me directly, as yourself, say to me, you're dope, I like your videos, you make me laugh, you've, you've actually helped me heal, you helped me heal some things. That makes me happy when I hear that. It makes me feel like, it makes me very emotional when I talk about this. That touches me deeply when someone approaches me like that. Then I hear sometimes I, I see, not hear, I, I see the haters, right? And some sometimes a, a hater, I believe it was saying, that would say, I tried nice, didn't work. Oh, when I'm nice, all hell breaks loose. That's a misunderstanding. It's a complete misunderstanding. You completely misunderstand me, who I am, how I approach people, what's happening in my brain, in my heart, okay? How I care, how I feel. You project way too much. You think I think like you. You think I think like your parents, you think that I must be playing a game like you are. No, I'm not playing a game. I can use humor sometimes. That's not a game. That's universal humor. Okay. Situational comedy. That is the kind of stuff that makes me smile. Or snicker. Sometimes I laugh. I wholeheartedly laugh about my own jokes <laughs> or my own 
observations of s situational comedy that can happen completely in my head when I'm under the shower or sit sitting in the recliner chair, wherever I am, it can be happening. Okay, sewing, suddenly I laugh. I'm not laughing about you, I'm not laughing about anyone. I laugh with the infinite about, and uh, not about in a bad way, but about and with at the same time, you know, I love I laugh inside of that. I see whatever I see, you know, whatever I observe. I laugh with it. And when when I say I laugh about it, it's I it's always meant well. I never laugh about someone in a cold ice cube type of way. Okay, never do. I observe misunderstandings. I observe bad behavior in people. And when I see someone say something nice to me, it means something to me. It really does. It touches my heart. Okay. And that's nice, you know, to go up to someone and say something nice when you mean it, not when you not mean it. You can't fake that. I know, and I know when it's not faked. When you're not faking kindness, it touches me. Okay. And then I approximately know how to put these dots together, you know, who is, who just approximately. I don't know, I think Danny said it, but I'm not sure. How can I be sure? If none of these people are showing themselves to me, okay? How can I, how can I know? And Danny, he should know that I am not, I'm not the, your therapist. I'm not a professional, detached, outside type of person, okay, that can look at you from the sky perspective all the time, you know, that's what a good therapist does, looking at, but a really good therapist should also not be above the, the client. We're on eye level, always. I'm always on eye level with everyone, always. That's the only way it works. I think that's extremely arrogant to, for anyone to put themselves on a pedestal over other people. I've seen many therapists do that. That's a mistake. That, that always backfires really badly. I've seen that happening at the center, how that backfired. It's a lot of people. Some people died because of it. That's how serious this is. When therapists put themselves on a pedestal. Because then they become this unattainable, unreachable, like godlike, wannabe godlike guru or something who is somehow above the client, you know, the client grinding their heads in their messed up, total cha chaotic homes while the therapist is sitting at home in their, in their million dollar house, everything is taken care of and they're, they're, they're eating their fine cheese or whatever. So no, it <laughs> that's not how things should go. That's not, that's not the way to approach these things. Or the therapist comes there driving onto the lot with their Mercedes-Benz convertible 
and the client is down and out crying their way into the center and the, and the therapist says I'm um, busy right now I'm still I'll see you later for the session <laughs> no it doesn't work that way sorry no it doesn't no, 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 no. while the center was already light years better than any other ther therapy institution in this regard but I still I still saw it I still saw these kind of mechanisms there where the therapist and I'm not going to mention names where the therapist is like oh I'm on some kind of pedestal oh you don't bother me right now you know I'm I'm busy you pawn have your your moment in at 2 p.m. as scheduled, right, in my schedule book. No, it doesn't work that way, sorry, no. When you're a therapist, you become automatically a mother. You become a caregiver. You become that safe haven for that living being, whether that's an animal or human. That, that's a lot of responsibility to take that on, okay? And then we have to act on that responsibility that this specific caregiving position entails, includes, okay, demands from us, okay? We have to be that. I personally take that very seriously, even though I, I, I was never ordained to become a primal therapist so I was there for three years in in the school later on I was I was there on and off as a client but I was in, in the training program for about th three years when Arjanov was still there and they never decided to give me this so, and I never they wanted to keep me coming and giving good money right so I mean that could be that that could drag on for 20 years that's the same tactic that that's the same tactic that that the scam artists are on whatever yeah. scam pyramid scale scams whatever are using yeah. you have to pay this now so that we will tell you this secret and then it keeps on going right so no they have all of that going to you know tentatively you know, it's not completely but there were these aspects definitely happening and that's not good okay, that's not that's not how i envision therapy treatment Therapy treatment, let's, let's say it very, very crystal clear, it should be free of charge, okay? And I know then a lot of people are not going to respect it enough and they're not going to treat it well because it's free after all. No? But that's, not, that's no argument against it. So we ha it has to be free because you can't play around with someone's life, okay? There are people that died from drug overdose and suicide, and that should have never happened. Okay, and one girl who painted like Leonardo da Vinci, and that should not have happened. Okay, that's a tragedy of unimaginable horror. What happened to her? And that was just during the time when I, when they had kicked me out of the center during that year is when that happened. I didn't even know about it until someone I knew was coming over and visiting me and telling me about it. I was so shaken up by that. I couldn't even talk for several hours because I really, I really loved that Mary and and I adored her artwork 
and I thought very highly of her. So that was a real shock to me. And, you know, thinking back, uh, I should have done everything I could. I should have stayed in touch with her. I saw her, I, when I saw her in the group session one time, I saw how, I saw how down and out she was. But I was also struggling and suffering and all of that. I wasn't really ready for this kind of closeness that this this would entail, you know, the, the a real closeness with someone. And I was afraid that she would want me as a girlfriend in a romantic way, and I am not even bisexual, so... And so, and this kind of closeness was, I was kind of shying away from this. But looking back at it, in order to save someone's life, <laughs> trust me, I'll go through all, a lot of legs to do it. Okay, I really will. Probably not. Not a sexual relationship, but I, I would move in with her, I would give her massages, I would cuddle with her like I cuddle with a dog, I would give her the, the mother love and that kind of stuff, I would. And that happened before one time in Germany there was a woman like that who wanted me in her life in this way and, and I had to reject her. She wanted to get into the bathtub with me, and I said, no, can't do it. <laughs> but I should have still let her move in. I should have still, I mean, I should have set the boundaries with this, of course. But I should have said, you can move in because I, you, I see you are extremely struggling and lonely. And I was lonely, so we at least had each other as friends. We could have helped each other. But there again, I was afraid of this. I was afraid of that closeness. So, and I see that in a lot of people. You know, a lot of people are afraid of that closeness. I even see, I see it in those people that are encountering someone who they would be sexually attracted to or are even sexually attracted to, and they still push that person away, whether that's same sex or opposite sex couples, right? When they are actually attracted to someone, but that person is too needy, right? So people get rejected for that reason, whether these, these people actually like them or not, or are attracted to that type of person or not. So needy people are often, very often, pushed away. Because most people have an issue with that, with this closeness, with the, the real intimacy, you know, the real family bond. You know, like, I'm taking care of him, I'm taking care of you. I, I have that with Paul, okay? and that's valuable and precious. And I have it with baby dog. So I am, I can't, I cannot express in words how infinitely grateful I am to have Paul and the baby dog in my life. They are my family. They are now my nuclear family in this lifetime. It's not easy. <laughs> I never said it was. Okay. It's not a picnic in the park. Okay. But I do it anyway because I care about them more than anything else. Okay? I love Paul and Baby Dog more than anything else. And that's the truth. And they love me the same way. And that is the love. It's a non-romantic love. 
this is the love, whether that happens in a relationship or in uh, just as friends, as, as buddies, as whatever, writing friends, talking friends, family member type of friends. Whichever way that real intimacy is happening, that's the kind of int intimacy and love that I want to bring into the world. Okay. I know my haters are afraid of intimacy. I can see it. And you are just like a wild, feral cat. I have seen feral cats. And sometimes they see me and they want to be near me. But I'm not allowed to come too close. Okay. Because they don't trust anyone. The, sometimes a feral cat will stretch their themselves long. Cats sometimes, they can stretch themselves very, very long, right? And they go like, I want to reach your hand and hold your hand. But as soon as I want to hold their hand, they retract and they, or they might even hiss at me and they, and they run away. So the haters accusing me of hissing, you know, like that kitty cat video meme. <laughs> you are doing it too, okay? So you are doing it in your version, okay? You are doing it and I'm not blaming you because you are feral cats. You're, you are feral tomcats. You are feral boy cats, okay? And you want the closeness, but you are afraid of it, okay? So you have to put on a disguise. And you have to come to me as a woman, <laughs> a woman disguise. I mean, this makes it so enormously easy on the Internet, right? Easier than ever before in history to do that. So in history, they had these masquerade, masquerade ballroom festivals, you know, during the Rococo and the Baroque era. And they would put on masks, and that was part of the whole game, you know. Like, you tried to figure out who I am. Sometimes the prince wanted to be disguised. He didn't want to be seen flirting with the housekeeper or whatever, you know, so, but these masks obviously didn't hold up literally very much <laughs> as the masks on the internet. Nothing is as mask proof, mask, mask, masquerade. Secure you know, as the internet, so but I see through it anyway <laughs> because I have psychic abilities. I see, particularly, it takes me a long time, but eventually, I see it. I see it happening the, the, the sock account games and all of that, but that also makes me cry. Why do you want to make me jealous? Why do you want to go into your cheating mode to make me jealous? Why, why do you want to go into the, the, the meat hook mode and the Freddy Krueger mode and, and the abusive clown mode and all of that? Why? Why do you want to make me suffer? Maybe because you completely misunderstood me. You completely misunderstand my behavior. You know, you come to me as a woman, I'm nice to you, and then you as whatever you identify yourself with, using a fake photo from someone else, still, you know, you don't use your own photo. I mean, I'm still waiting for the day that you do, you know. so, but you, s but then whatever you are, your main account, that your flirt, main flirt account, 
under someone else's name and someone else's photo then that under that account you will suddenly be nice to me because I was nice to that whatever pretty thing okay so which I think is pretty thing is sane so it took me years to figure that out years and years and years I had this sweet girl friendship with pretty thing on Facebook and then Pretty Singh broke up with me. What a bummer. I was so sad. But then, yeah, it took me another couple of years to figure out how it was sane, after all, you know. And that's the only way he could be, you know, like the feral cat. He could be, yeah, I want to be friends with you, but I don't want you to come too close to me. So, you know, reaching all the way up to there. And more and more and more. I can't touch this topper container. See, I do it with OCD. And then as soon as I am um, taking your hand, you retract and you run off and you say, Ugh! Yikes. Don't come too close. Oh, you needy dork, you. So, yeah, and I'm not, I don't blame you. You are very messed up in the head. And that's, I'm not saying this as a put on. I say that, I say that because I see it. I see you, I see your suffering. Okay, and I have compassion. I have compassion for you. But don't take mistake this statement now as looping myself back in, okay? B which I'm not going to, do. never going to do, okay? because I see the whole picture now. I see what you're doing, and and the other people doing the same thing. Okay, so I see what you're doing. And obviously, this type of connection, this type of communication is disguised from your side, okay? And because of the disguise, because of this, the barrier that you put between yourself and me, you are doing it. I have never put a barrier between us. You are the one doing it. I just want you to become very crystal clear about it. I want you to introspect and see this, that you're doing this, okay? You are doing it. This barrier does not allow us to come close to each other. I'm not, I like, like I said many times before, I'm not even picky, you know. So, you know, in the past I would have even gone to someone's prison and announced myself to the prison guard. I am Freddy Krueger's internet crush love. So can I have a phone conversation through, through the, the glass wall with Freddy Krueger? Hi Freddy. How are you doing? Freddy on the phone. Yeah, I'm not doing so well, <laughs> but don't come in here. I'm afraid of, I, I'm afraid of closeness. Don't, don't come in here and have sex with me. No, 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 you can't do that. <laughs> no, that's, that goes, that goes completely against the rules of your internet persona game. Right? That's, that would be frightening. That would be how do you call it? That would be you have a specific term for that. Curiously frightening or whatever however you call it, you know. So frighteningly interesting. <laughs> whatever. Yeah. So yeah, 
that's what I am for you. I'm a frightening curiosity. <laughs> at best, and <laughs> a monster at worst. So I don't blame you for it because when you grew up your whole life, you have never come across someone like me. Never, ever. Okay. Never. I am an ET from out of space for you. That is what I am. Okay. I am an absurdity for you. Okay. Because you just can't, you just cannot possibly put this beingness that I am. You calling me unit now. You cannot put this unit here into any kind of little shuli frame that is out there and that you grew up with. Okay. My feet don't fit into those shulis of your exes and also mentally my feet don't might not even fit into your shoes. Your shoes may not be big enough for my shoe, for my feet, for my platform feet. <laughs> now, men size 12, that's, that's it, the average, I guess the average men size foot, but I'm a woman, so for a woman it's on the large foot size, of course, but it's not monst monstrously large, so I've seen women with larger feet than I have. And they all have trouble finding shoes. So, but even I have trouble finding shoes. So, the, with the shoe, with my shoe, shoe search, so shoe, so true, so short search. <laughs> that is the tongue breaker. On my shoe search on the internet, or in a store, also even. It was more than annoying. Not because my feet are so much bigger, but my feet are always one size too big. <laughs> Just this one size too big for the women's shoes. Man, that sucks. You have no idea. So. <laughs> you don't understand how that sucks. Okay. When, when, Every shoe that I like, every boot, you know, winter boots and stuff, they only come up to maximally women's size, women's size 12, which is men's size 11. So I would need women's size 13. Okay, so women's size 12, maximum doability. There is nothing else to do. Every tall woman with big feet has to buy men's shoes, okay? Or we have to go to a transvestite shoe store, okay? I was even mocked about this way back in the days when I was hanging out with my rock and roller friends. Okay? They were mocking me about it. My, my best girlfriend, same height as me, but two shoe sizes, smaller shoes, feet. Okay. So her boyfriends, and they all mocked me really, really hard. They would never stop mocking me about this. I, I don't know. I don't see what is so incredibly terrible <laughs> about having just one shoe size too big. I, I don't, I, I can't wrap my head around it. Why why that is such an issue, right? <laughs> it's only an issue when I can't find the right shoes to fit. Right. So and that's what I mean by uh, modern day Cinderella. <laughs> it's a sort of, it's it's a joke. It really is. So yeah, but I got these boots here, winter boots, I, I got them in the right size, so it happens rarely that I can find them in the right size. But there are always men's. For, me, for hunter men with hunter 
camouflage pattern, but I say okay, let it go, accept it, uh, it's okay. I would much rather have flower patterns on it, so, but the flower pattern boots don't come up to that size. <laughs> <laughs> Because if I would if I would go down to that hunter guy there and ask him if he has boots with flower patterns on it, he will laugh about me at best and pull out his rifle at worst. So But yeah, whatever, okay. I'm not even that gigantic. I'm 5'9", and my, my shoe size is women's size 13. So that's not like, it's not super giant, okay. It's, it's on the large, tall side, okay, so. Big frame, big body, tall, big, long back. Yeah, but I have seen much taller women, in Germany particularly. So Germany has a lot of tall women, <coughs> also from my own generation even, so not just the new generations. So I've seen enormously tall women in Germany sometimes. I felt like a dwarf next to them. <laughs> so, yeah. It is what it is. But. but in regards to closeness and intimacy, I see you. Okay. I see what's happening psychologically. You're afraid. You also have things to hide. You're a criminal. Uh, that adds heavily to this equation. You're, you're looked for by Interpol. <laughs> Every one of you. Okay looked for by Interpol. Don't go to the FBI, they say to me, no. because the FBI works together with Interpol. <laughs> but anyway, whatever you're doing, whether you're robbing banks or whatever, I don't want, even want to say the other things. You know love has to come into the world. You know it very well. You are very aware of that. I know you are. Okay, You are aware of it. So do your best to end your criminal behavior. Do your best to free every living being that you are holding hostage or in cages. Free every living being, whether you're a pig farmer, free the pigs. Whether you're a child, labor, slaveholder or sex slave operating ring slaveholder organ harvesting slaveholder whatever you're doing let these living beings free do it now you don't have to turn yourself in i'm not even asking for that just let these living beings free let the dogs Anim all animals, horses, pigs, cows, let them free. Bring them to a sanctuary. Bring them to an animal shelter. Okay. Call the authorities. Bring the child to the police station. Bring the children to a hospital. I've seen this happen one time in a crime report. There were white men, the party types. They were playing around with two girls that were partying with them. And they played around with them too hard. And they overdosed them because they wanted to have prolonged sex, group sex with them. So they overdosed them. And they were also on drugs, and they were very reckless, really, really, really reckless. And they overdosed them too much, 
and the two girls died from it and they got really scared and one was one was still alive while they were in their house and so they brought they they split the up into two groups and they brought they first brought the one that was still alive to a hospital dropped her off there and quickly left so there was still a glimpse of compassion right so oh my goodness what did we do here we bring her to the hospital maybe they can fix her but they couldn't so she died later in the hospital and then the other one died was dead already and they brought her also to a different hospital and they quickly left so i want you to bring any kind of any person that you have you're holding hostage that you are that you have in your in your possession whether caged or drugged or whatever I want you to bring that person to the hospital. Women, children, bring the animals to the animal shelters. Okay, No questions asked, you can leave. Do it. Set these beings free and never ever incarcerate a living being again. Okay, That is your contribution to make the world a better place. You can do it. Peace and love.